Welcome to the Poe Politicking Show. Founded in 2008, Poe Politicking is a hip-hop meets self-help brand. With each interview, we teach the babies and share success secrets with you, the listener. Past guests of the Poe Politicking Show include Yo Gotti, Currency, MC Light, BG, Dead Press, Rashida, Project Pat, and more. We also showcase the future upcoming stars of hip-hop. Subscribe on iTunes and get automatic updates of each podcast episode. Popolitikin.com. Hey, my name is Gabrielle Solange and I am on Popolitikin. Check me out on Spotify and YouTube at Gab's Whole Story. Welcome back to PolPolitikin.com, your home for self-help meets hip-hop. Make sure you download our app on iTunes, subscribe, like, comment to this interview. I'm now politicking with Gabrielle Solange. How you doing? Hey, 
It's just um, been a really great Thanksgiving, actually. Uh, what you do for Thanksgiving? Went out of town for a little bit, picked up some family, decorated a Christmas tree, you know, the traditional stuff. All right. So where's your hometown? Where are you from? Um, I'm kind of from all over, but I grew up a good portion of my childhood in Toledo, Toledo, Ohio. So right now I'm in Columbus. All right. So talk about your background a little bit. How did you get involved with music? Well, um, I grew up in a very musical family. So I honestly, I kind of just assumed that like everyone could sing. Because it was like everywhere, my whole family could sing. I'd turn on Disney movies and everybody could sing there. And I just, honestly, I just thought like, it's really strange. Like I really just thought that that was part of everybody. And then, you know, as I started to venture out into the world and people made a big deal about singing. I felt actually, I felt very um, embarrassed. Um, and I would like purposely throw my voice and, and botch auditions. Like I didn't want to be, I didn't want people to single me out any more than I already stood out. Um, Cause I was actually like, I grew up just very insecure. I grew up the only black person in my class um, very, very often every year. And so I just kind of, dealt with a lot of insecurity and didn't want to stand out. Um, but, but in secret, I was obsessed with music. My family was just so talented. And um, I just remember writing songs and singing in the mirror, imagining crowds, just believing I was supposed to be heard. So who are some of your influences? Musical influences, um, aside from my own family, would be... Definitely like Jackson 5 and uh, Nat King Cole, Diana Ross. Um, I grew up just with like older classic music and then also like pop music. Lots of pop music, Backstreet Boys, um, Janet Jackson, just like a, a huge mix. And Spanish music, actually. My mother is a, a Spanish teacher and a French teacher, and so I grew up with a lot of Spanish music. Hmm. All right, and then speaking of groups, you was in a group back in the day, right? That was so back in the day, yep. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, I don't know, I always looked at it like the BET's version of Making It the Bad. Yeah, yeah. So how was that experience? Oh, man. And then um, I was looking at your bio, I didn't know y'all was that young. So how old were y'all back then? Right, I was 15 when I got signed to Sony Records. Um, yeah, that was, what, how, it was like 10, 12 years ago? It's a long time ago. But yeah, how was it? That's such a loaded question. Um, my friends make fun of me <laughs> a lot because I used to have like PTSD. <laughs> like it was like I don't know if you ever talked to like someone who actually was a celebrity before. Like I don't know like all the history of everyone you've ever done interviews with, but it was a lot. Um, it, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. I think if you get more specific, I could do better. Mm. It was a lot, meaning, <laughs> how was it a lot? Just Well, I think each person in the group um, was individually impacted in their own way, and all of it was intense. We were these, like, it was nothing like making of the band where, you know, a bunch of random people auditioned to try to be stars. We were all these inner city poor kids. You know, and we had all these crazy lives and we had come together through an inner city program that offered a chance for kids to get off the street to do music, hmm. which is which is kind of cool, because honestly, it's a lot of the inspiration for what I do now with my life in music um, is just going back into the community. But we came together organically. We began performing wherever we could and we were part of that inner city group that opened doors for us to perform in schools all over the city and then suddenly we were performing um in galas and we were performing um with you know with in in front of more prestigious audiences and i felt like we were kind of like a spectacle for these like rich people They're like whoa these inner city poor kids but they got this talent and we like that and when and and we just felt like uh we just felt it was so amazing. Like I remember shopping at the store for my performance clothes that night to go to this like fancy theater and perform for all these people. And through us just performing out and being ourselves, 
we um, got a really cool opportunity to perf to record some music, and that music got into the hands of some rich people over in New York. And um, from there, we just, oh, like, literally overnight, I grew up in, um, like, I have a crazy life myself, and I, I mean, just like everyone else in my group, but I mine is distinct because I actually grew up as a foster kid. So I had, like, this really dark outlook on life, and music was how I made it through everything. And so um, I had these two prayer requests, you could call them, and throughout my teenage years. One of them was, God, please kill me. <laughs> and the other was, yes. Because I was just a really, like, I mean, I was just low. It was a, I was always, like, hopping around. I felt I switched high school five times. Um, I just, you know, switched homes. I was like, nobody wants me. I don't understand. You know, I had already grown up. Um, very insecure from before I had gotten to foster care. And then by the time I was 12, I was a runaway. And so I had this crazy, intense life. And music was like how I got through. And so my other prayer request was, oh, by the way, I would also really love to be a singer because I remember wanting that at one point and thinking that that makes sense. And the crazy thing is it happened. And before I knew it, through a series of events, I was on my first plane. I was touring the country with you know, people like Chris Brown and Aaron Carter and back when you remember Pretty Ricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the, <laughs> the bands we toured with. And um, just just so many amazing experiences. And I went from nobody wanting me to like, seem like the whole world wanted to hear what I had to say. It was crazy. And then just like that, as, as much as you have ever watched VH1, Where Are They Now, or like One Hit Wonders, it's like just as soon as it happened, it all fell apart. Um, and it was like hard to go from like foster care to red carpets to I don't even know how to drive because I had drivers while I was in my band. So now I have to come home and get a job and ride the bus. Hmm. So, what it, so when you was talking about the PTSD, is that why you say you have PTSD? I think just um, the things that I went through being in the band and the things that I went through after coming out of that band, um, having to return home to my city and figure out what to do, um, not having parents to return to, not having that foundation of love already. Like uh, I kind of came home to like, now what? And uh, it was really hard. It was definitely hard for every person in my band, but it was, you know, I only know my story. So it was definitely challenging. And it's one of the reasons why I took such a long time to return to music. So what, what did you end up doing? Like, because you were right saying like when you, yeah, so kind of, I guess, kind of take us from, okay, after the group to how you got to where you are today. Well, it was a span of 12 years. So I'll try to summarize real quick because I really do I think um for me I understand that I have you know a story to tell so as soon as someone sees that I've been in a band I it's natural to ask me but I'm very I mean, I'm very thankful to answer those questions for people but I'm just so excited to like move forward and so I guess real quick um what happened in those 12 years is I came home had nothing to really return to I was almost homeless many times um I had to ride the bus, had to get jobs, people, um, you know, the funny thing is people actually um, were very uh, not embracing of when we came home. I think it's like, you know, it's kind of crazy if you ever see like how a city supports or doesn't support their own. It's like when you're on top, they support you. And when you're not, then they reject you. And so it's kind of like that, you know, people... People ask me, like, why I was back home. Like, why are you here? Did you fail? I would be trying to order, like, food. And they'd be like, I know you. Wait, wait, what are you doing here? Did you fail? Or, like, you're not a star or you're a one-hit wonder. So I literally walked around, like, slowly not wanting to show my face and slowly wanting to just hide. And by the time, like, a few years later from returning, I had used up any money I had taking trips, like, to New York. I remember starting to write songs and – um people suggesting I give them or sell them to other artists. And I, at that point I was very young. And so I was just like, 
no, no way. There's no way I'm selling my songs. I am a singer. These are my songs. And <laughs> why, what are you trying to say? I was like, what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say I'm not going to make it as a singer? Like, are you trying to say I failed too? And I was just so hurt and sad. And it was so much um, shallowness in that, you know, in those circles, in those, um, you know, meetups with those different artists. And everyone was just so, to be honest, there was just such a mixture of thirstiness and shallowness. And just like, I felt like I was slowly losing something very important. And I didn't know how to get it back. And one day it just hit me. Like I tried to write a song for an artist and I just had nothing. And that my whole life I've been able to write it was one of the things that people bragged about. When producers bragged about, like, Gabrielle, when she gets in the studio, just let her do her thing. She knows what she's doing. I mean, it was just so so freely flowing. And then suddenly, the thing that used to set me free just made me feel trapped. Like, it has to be good enough. It has to help me. Like, what if I can't do it? And, like, suddenly it just became this this haunting burden to do the thing that used to set me free. And that's when I just didn't really know how to like handle life and so I just kind of returned home um my city was very just I didn't want to be in Columbus at the time because I didn't find much support there and uh I slowly realized later on um that maybe I should well I thought maybe I should try to just have a normal life so I tried to get jobs I worked like three four jobs at one point and I was just obsessed. I was like, I got to get out of my situation. If I can just make enough money, if I can just, you know, I would ride my bike to work. I remember almost getting robbed. Like, I had went through some crazy stuff. Like, every day it was some crazy story. I would come home, and my sister would be like, dang, your life is, like, really crazy. And I remember every time I thought in my head, you know, I could do music, I would feel like, well, how? Because I had had a manager. And I had had a publicist and I had had a team and a label and producers. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't, oh, what am I supposed to do? Like produce my own music or record myself, promote myself? What does that look like? I can't make it. I'm, I can't do that. And so I just would just sink into just a depression of like, why doesn't anybody believe in me anymore? And um, I remember the crazy thing is I had released a song for free. Um, after coming back home and um, that song some some fan took it and blew it up and went viral and I didn't even know about it and my managers reached out to me my old managers who you know didn't want to continue to support me anymore or didn't want to go solo with me or do anything they reached out just to take their like 20 percent they're like hmm. well by the way uh, that song kind of sort of belongs to us a little bit uh, even though, you, you know, it was just like, we just wanted to say hi, and uh, how did you get millions of views? I was like, what? What? How? What are you talking about? I don't have millions of views. They're like, yes, you do on YouTube. How would you do that? And I was like, I, I don't know. I didn't know that was that was there. And at that point, they were just like, well, well, you shouldn't have done that because we need to be paid. So you need to give us your 20%. 20 and I was like, fine, whatever, take it. And I just returned to my desk job because I didn't know what to do. I was like, okay, take your 20%. Uh, thanks. Like, I just, I, my mind was just, like, I just literally didn't know. Like, at that point, I think this generation was changing. And it was turning into a generation where you can release something on YouTube and capitalize on that. But I didn't, honestly, know that. And it's just same. It's the same way, like, how I returned home and I didn't know how to drive like every other normal young adult because I had been being driven around by other people. So I just came home and I just thought, you know, I can't make it. They don't think I can make it, so it must be true. And I just kind of tried to live a normal life for, like, years. Um, fast forward to now, um, I have uh, a, just a few different things happened. And I think a couple years back, I just really was going through a lot. And I, I, I wasn't doing music at the time. I wasn't being honest with myself at the time. I wasn't journaling. Um, and a really, my best friend is an amazing person. She really pushes me. We push each other a lot. Um, she's finished her novel recently and I finally just put out an EP. And one thing she did was just tell me to just like get my, just express my heart again, just to try it. She used to just joke with me and she's like, it's not like you're trying crack. Like, just do it. Like, just do something for yourself. And I was like, what? I don't want to. And, um, when I did that, 
I remember one moment I just broke down and wrote a song and out of that, um, and out of that song, I was like, wow, I really, I really want to do this again just for myself. And so I just started making music and hiding it just for myself. Um, and that slowly de began to develop who I was and it just started to draw me out. And now I guess I'm to the point where, um, I, I guess something hit me like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I, I can't, I can't, I have to let go of what, um, what happened. I have to let go of the rejection. I have to let go of like my victim mindset that says you need people. And I thought to myself, okay, well, if I don't have a producer, then I will just record acapella songs. And so I made my acapella song and it's on the EP. And then I was like, but I do need music. So I think, you know, I know that I'm talented. So I, I saved up and I bought this keyboard, um, this keyboard right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, I saved up and I bought this keyboard and, and I just was like slowly getting the stuff I need and s spending hours learning to produce. And then when I finally would learn one software, I would like buy the newest or upgrade. And it just got to the point where before I knew it, I had this mindset of like, well, my stuff is just for me. It's not that great. You know, it's just amateur. But then I didn't realize like I had been slowly learning to make it sound crisp and clear and using everything I'd ever learned. And I began playing it for people and they were like, this sounds just like the stuff on the radio. And that's when it kind of hit me, like, I need to decide how I want to appear to the public again, because I know that I shouldn't give up just yet. And yeah. that's where I'm at now. Yeah, I've been saying, I kind of was kind of feeling like, seems like you're taking more accountability now. Like, before you was kind of just, like, more, like, in the victim mode. But now it seems like you're taking more accountability. Yeah. All right. So what, is the, what are your current projects? What are you working on right now? Um, well, actually, I'm excited because everything has changed about the way that I see myself as an artist. Um, I just I realized, like, going through the experience that I went through and just meeting artists along the way who totally get eaten alive and lost in their craft, like in their creative process. Um, I realized, like, it's so important for me to just be who I am no matter where that takes me. Um, and so I've just kind of, every day I'm reassessing what it looks like to pursue my dream. And I'm a very spiritual person. And that happened actually a lot while I was uh, <laughs> going through what I was going through, um, highs and lows. Um, and so for me, I really incorporate God into everything I do now. Like, not that I didn't before, but before it was very like, God, sure, if you want to help me, that'd be nice. Sorry that I suck. Now it's like, hey, God, like, it's me again. The one that you favor, the one that you never forgot, the one that you always pursue, um, the one who you are constantly restoring. And I really want to be honest with you. And I, and I want from that place, I want to share that with people. No matter what, what it looks like, no matter if it's, you know, messy or you know, that's why I, I, one of the things I learned is like, I, I really never want to try to fit myself into a label or a genre. I know that it's like this, like old traditional mindset, this formulaic thing, the system that says like, oh no, you have to choose a sound for, in order for you to have an audience, you know? And that's one of the things that, that Sony and like the labels tried to do to us. And I realized like, they're absolutely a hundred percent wrong. Like they're just, they're just absolutely wrong. And I realized like, one, one of the things that comes, like, my, my musical inspiration, I'm not a gospel artist in the traditional sense, um, but I just believe that I should be able to express whatever is going on in my life, whether that's a gospel song or whether that's a breakup song or whether that's, you know, I don't know, a revenge song. <laughs> I've done that. And I guess I'm just to the point where I just want to be who I am, and I think that's what the world needs to see is just people who are free to be who they are. Um, without having to be limited by that season or that genre. I think um, genres are meant to define music, not people. And so I can, you know, express myself and flow in and out of different genres and in and out of different styles. And um, so right now I'm creating a project more th more thematic than, it's not based on more of a style or a genre, but it's based on more of like a theme of something that I need to express in order to feel more whole as a person. Um, and so the project I'm working on, I have a few, and it's kind of crazy because I have a few completely separate projects. Um, 
One of them is based off of a trip I took to Africa, which was part of my musical restorative journey. And it's going to be a completely different project than anything that I'm doing. Um, and um, the fun, the cool thing is one of the songs from that project is on the EP that I just released because I wanted the EP to just be like a random preview of me. So there's no theme to the EP. There's just It's just a preview of stuff that I do. Um, and that's just available right now on Spotify. It just... Was it, it just became live on Spotify on the 21st of November. And um, I'll just be focusing on working on my album. I'm hoping to complete a Christmas song and put it out before Christmas. And I also am a vocal coach. Um, and that is exciting to me because in the journey of like coming back home and trying to figure out like how can I support myself and you know get out of my situation financially, there was always that like mystery, like I need a solution. Like how can I do music and pay rent if I'm not famous, you know? And I finally am transitioning into just being a vocal coach and just doing music gigs in order to support myself. And this is like a very recent thing. So I've been celebrating that. That was my Thanksgiving theme was like, Oh my God, like I get to pour into people and help them discover their voice while I have time to actually do the same for myself. So it's a big deal. Um, and I, right now I'm going into a school and kind of doing the same thing with the school that people did for me when I was younger. And it's just bringing these maybe underexposed or underprivileged children, music and art and improv. And I have like a group of really amazing, talented friends that will come with me and do this with me. Um, and so it's pretty awesome. What's your opinion on the law of attraction? Um, I believe it's just like the law of gravity. I think um, it works, but there there's limitations. And um, I definitely believe it's a real law. Um, I know that some people don't, but I also think that some people hold it high above everything as if the law of attraction is magic or if the law of attraction is God himself. And no, it's just a law. It's literally like in the same way that gravity is a law. Um, the law of attraction is in the earth. It is at work in the universe. However, there are limitations and there are, um, you know, there's still things that not everybody can understand. And that's why I just trust God because I kind of feel like it's kind of like astrology. It's like, do people, you know, a lot of people really love astrology. Some people go really deep. Some people just like to use it in like a simple, subtle, fun way, like check my horoscope. Is that real? Is there truth to it? Is there science behind it? Is there science against it? All of those things are correct. But I kind of feel like for me, I'm like, why would I like look to stars when the maker of the stars wants to whisper secrets to me in my secret place? That's how I feel. So yeah, the law of attraction is real. But I think it's really easy to get caught up on that and be like, yo, I need to like want this enough and do my part and just keep confessing that it's going to happen and it's going to attract it. I'm like, yeah, that works, but then it's still about me. But when I trust God, when I spend time with God, I really feel the the real direction and the inspiration that helps me to know like how to prioritize all these things that I want, you know, because if I'm just attracting what I want, that could be destructive. But if I'm just spending time with him, then like I feel like more of an understanding of what I should want comes out and I can even attract better. And then also there's grace. And so because I trust God rather than a law of attraction, I feel like if I am attracting terrible things into my life, I can rely on his mercy. Whereas some people, they just live in these cycles of attracting the wrong things and there's like, there's no escape. So I rely on mercy. I rely on grace. I rely on inspiration and diligence. Um, and I, and I'm just aware of the law of attraction in the same way I'm aware of gravity or I'm aware that if I eat crap, I'm going to get overweight, <laughs> but there's mercy for that. <laughs> you That's know, a good so answer. Just, huh? I like that answer. Yeah. Right. It's an interesting question. What's your favorite book? Some of your favorite books. One of my favorite books is what I'm reading right now. It's called the perfect you. It's by a neuroscientist. Her name is Dr. Caroline Leaf. It's the one where they like he point the finger at him. It's like a finger, right? It's no, like a red book. Um, Ain't it a red like, book? I think I got that book. It's like a no, red it's book. No, it's blue. It's oh. dark blue. Oh. And but, you but should it's like totally a hand, check right? it out. No. Oh, I look it up. <laughs> it's called the Perfect You: A Blueprint for Identity. Um, it's the third 
well, she's got, like, I think it's the fourth book. Um, cause she came out first, first with who switched off my brain. And then she came out with switch on your brain. And then she came out with think and eat yourself smart or something like that. And then she came out with the perfect you. And basically her research is all about those different laws that we, you know, one of them, which we were just talking about. Um, but more about like neuroplasticity and the ability for you to through your mind and through your thinking, um, kind of recreate your brain, which impacts even your DNA in the next generation. And that's like gets into epigenetics. It's pretty amazing. And the reason I got into that is because while I was in my mud pit of just like sulking and, you know, I grew up in an abused life. I grew up with a lot of rejection, a lot of racism, a lot of just things that really tried to beat me down. And then when I finally got up, it's like, then, then I crashed even harder and it was really hard to overcome that. And so I needed to believe in my own worth. I needed to, I needed to feel like my process was valid. Um, when like, you know, haters or ex-boyfriends or just like maybe the industry or just people, enough people just tell you, you know, you're not worth it or that you need to change. I just needed to find out what was right with me. And I think one day I was literally like watching TV and this chick was talking about the brain and your process and how to really make progress and who you are. And I was just fascinated by her. And I have been following her work ever since. Hmm. All right. And describe an average day for you. What are your daily habits you do? A day for me is like different. Every day is different. Tomorrow. But do you have like some rituals you do every day? Um, I'm actually, the funny thing is because I just had a birthday, I have been reevaluating my rituals. So I used to like work out with a trainer. Uh, Blue Collar Grind is like a local fitness um, company. And Orlando was my trainer. He's like an amazing motivational person. But he was part of my routine. And then like, even with that, I just wasn't, it wasn't ritualistic enough. So I'm thinking, um, one of the things that I was missing out on is spending time with myself and just writing and creating for the sake of writing and creating. Because now that I have the new, like, I really want to be heard again. I believe in what I'm doing and who I am as an artist. I think I have to really find a way to balance that with, but no matter what, I write for me. Because I have had the experience of feeling the pressure and feeling like the expectations of, you know, trying to be what people want. And sometimes it really gets in me and makes me anxious. And I've heard someone, uh, I heard one of my favorite singers say, uh, anxiety is like the, the enemy of creativity. And so just like, honestly, making sure that this journey is all about me being the best me and just believing, you know, re redefining what success really is. Um, making sure I stay grounded and, you know, and, and doing what I need to do. Like for, cause like, for instance, this week I can go back to that underprivileged school. The, the week that I got there to do a vocal music workshop, I was only supposed to go there once. But when I got there, they told me that one of their students had just been murdered two days earlier. And just looking at the situation and feeling the tension and learning more about these children who did not feel much self-worth at all. You know, I just felt like, how can I walk away? You know, this is what I really am supposed to be doing. So just trying to balance stuff like that and connect with the right people and still find a way to like, how do I build a career from just who I really am and what I really need to be doing, whether, whether there's funding in it or not, whether there's notoriety in it or not and trust that that's right. Trust that that will take me where I'm going. You know, when I see other people around me just trying to get more followers, like the more traditional way. And how do I like mix everything I know with saying ba like a balanced person. That's what I'm working on. How do you define success? Um, <laughs> well, that's funny because someone asked me that not too long ago and I had an answer. <laughs> um, give me a second. Let me see if I can help myself. I do this thing where I actually write letters to myself when I'm in the right mind, because I know that there will come a time where I'm in the wrong mind and I'll really need to remember the truth. Um, so I feel like I've probably written myself a letter about it, <laughs> but, um, give me, I think, 
I think I would say success for me is I think success for me would be knowing my worth and creating out of that place um, and doing everything I can to continue because I really believe that that's enough and it's really hard to know that that's enough because in the world one, one thing you realize as soon as you grow up is unless it's making money it's not important you know um, or you know just or unless someone is affirming you um, then it's not important and so for me success is remaining who I really am and finding a way to help people through that or you know, impact people through that, that doesn't take away who I am. I think that for me, I'm like all about identity right now, I guess. And just holding on to that and putting that into everything I do. Because I really believe that that will attract, I guess you could say, <laughs> the right audience in the right time and protect me at the same time. Will you see yourself five years from now? That's a, I don't know. Where do you see yourself five years from now? Balling. Now, five years from now, where I see myself? Uh, I don't know. I'm on, a, I'm, I'm just like on, on the quest. I like know thyself. So hopefully just more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I'm always trying to just improve each day. So five years from now should be five years of improvement. But what does that mean? I find out in five years. <laughs> ha! See there? Asking questions, man. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Five years from now, okay. I think that if you're gonna if you're gonna say where you can be five years from now, you gotta have fun with it. Why not? Right. I mean, you gotta have fun with it. So I think you should be like super bold about it and really say where you would like to see yourself. You know, especially if you do believe in the law of attraction. You know, um, even like like going back to my spirituality. A lot of the, the stuff that we, you know, tout around today as like new knowledge or trending is just old wisdom. There's a verse in the Bible that says, call things that are not as though they already were. Mm -hmm. It's basically saying, speak it into existence. Um, and it even talks about writing down the things that God has put in your heart and putting it before you so that you can run after it. That's basically modern day vision board. So I have a vision board you know, of everything. Um, and I have all that. So if I was going to be super bold and have crazy faith, I would say five whole years, anything is possible without having the expectation that like, oh, I haven't made it if this doesn't happen. But just living with expectancy can be fun if you know who you are and you know that your worth and success doesn't rise and fall on these specific things having to happen in this way. But you got to have a plan, right? So... Mine would be, I would have my own clothing line. I already have a name for it, and I already have designs for it and my concept. Um, and I would have my own clothing line, and I would have my YouTube channel would be <laughs> better, way better. You know, I would have my, I want to have animated music videos because I'm an artist, um, and I, lo I really love putting art with music and so I would like to have animated music videos I would like to um have my clothing line very successful and I would like profits of that um really going into programs like the one that I am starting right now with these children and they would be funded and they would have notoriety for all the right reasons and just bring attention into people being able to dig into their own self and find their worth and put that back out into the world and heal um, and I would love to be back in Hollywood on my own. I would love to be walking the red carpet and speaking my mind and speaking my heart in my music. Um, and hopefully be married <laughs> and, um, maybe like have a kid or two, but like five years, you know, maybe have like one kid. I don't know. So you still... I don't know. I was, like the way I thought you was trying to say, like you wanted to be in music, but you still you didn't want to be in as far as the industry or the, or the spotlight. So you want that again? When I say I don't want, it, like I'm, what I mean is I want <coughs> to be there on my own terms. I don't see how that can happen though. 
I like, know, right? It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to see. It seems like <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I'm not trying to be on some negative stuff, but it just seems like to really get out there, it's kind of like they almost got like sell their soul to you. True. So you I don't see so, like, huh? yeah, I don't well, see because you know, especially you when you were saying like you don't want to fit a genre. I just you know what I'm saying because then it seems like you do have to get a genre. Like you have to play that game to get right. Well, so you know better this, than me. Cause you, you know. Well, I mean, there's examples of people like Tori Kelly or 21 Pilots. Um, I don't think it's wrong to link up with a larger corporation, but I believe that they should be, you know, just having more creative control and being able to, you know, own that part of your career is, is this all I'm saying, you know, and. I think it, it is very hard. You're right. And that's why it's fun. Remember? Like speculating five years—that's fun. You I would say uh, to... <laughs> I don't think. Cause I remember when you first started; they probably didn't have three hundred and sixty deals. So, what do you think about like three hundred and sixty deals? How they got all those deals? Like Literally, that? have no idea what that is. What is that? Three hundred and sixty deals, basically, like okay, you're an artist, but they basically make make money off everything you do, not just the music. So, tours, merchandise. If you got a TV show, they get money from that. Anything. Who's they? The label. Called 360, so everything you do, not just the music and the album, like everything you do, they get a cut. Yeah, <laughs> it, it depends on it depends on how much of it they're responsible for. Like yeah. if they're responsible for your tour and they're responsible for your merchandise and they're responsible for that, then yeah, whatever, they can get a cut. Mm -hmm. Like it's not about like it's just about retaining creative control and you know not being taken advantage of, you know, like, like you said, selling your soul. That's bullshit. Sorry. Am I allowed to cuss on your show? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you good. <laughs> I did listen to the other podcast and I was like, all right, I think I'm good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you good. So okay. what advice, what advice would you give to any, any, uh, listener that wants to get into music, make a career, kind of follow your path? What would you tell them? Well, I'm still trying to figure it out. If you notice, <laughs> like I'm literally, I'm, I'm slightly clueless um, when it comes to having to build a fan base because I mean, I got a fan base overnight, you know, a long time ago and I put out free music and then it blew up and then I didn't even, I didn't even promote it properly or capitalize on it in a way where people could find me. Literally people were like, who's, who's this buy? I don't even know. Buying my song across the, like over, all over the world, not even knowing who I was. And I don't think I had the know-how or the understanding of, like, how to take advantage of all of the resources that we have and the access that we have to each other and to fans. And so I had to learn that. And I'm learning that even now. Like, I spent some time in business helping businesses grow. Like, it's been 12 years. I've been all over and done a lot of stuff. And so just trying to balance that out, all I would say is if you're a musician, the very first part that's very important is – Work on your product. Make sure it is completely unique um, and excellent. And I believe you should do a little bit of research of how to get it out there in a way that benefits you mostly. And then start networking. Um, reach out to radio stations, to podcasts like this one. Um, and just do everything you can to get your music out. Because at the end of the day, if it's as amazing as you think it is, then it will attract the right people. That's what I have to believe. You know, I'm mean, I have to believe that. But at the same time, there are so many talented people and this keeps me humble. And there's so many amazing and talented people that will never hear. And that's totally okay for them to be that amazing and talented. There's still, it's still worth it to, for them to do their music and to, and to work on their craft. Because it's bigger than being known or being famous or having money off of it. I mean, the goal is to support yourself so that you can do more of what you love. Which one is more important to you, talent or hard work? That's why I think I think you can have you can have all the talent in the world, but then you can have somebody that just has that work ethic. And I think that like Soldier Boy is an example to me, like. He's not really talented, but he had the. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's still around. He's making money, so that's why I say uh, like sometimes it's like if you have that work ethic, you good. I feel like there's people who work really hard and they're still not like they're still not reaping the rewards as other people. Maybe they don't have the right connection, or maybe they're missing that like one big break. Um, I think it de it depends on how you define work. 
I think there's a type of work that can really wear you down and, and sort of contaminate your talent. Like I've been through that where it becomes like to consume you and it almost is like it, it takes away the uniqueness of your music because you're afraid to really just like do your music the way that you would do it. If you had no audience, if you had no pressure, mm. I think that's really important. Um, Devon Franklin, if you know that is, he's a producer. He just produced the movie, the star with Oprah and Mariah and Tyler Perry and all that. One thing he said recently was, we're always trying to make what's hot. And he said, you haven't discovered that you're already hot. And you just need to, like, dig in deeper and find that element that the world is waiting for. Because, oh, yeah. you know, and I really believe that. And so it's important to, to put hard work into the right things. That's all I'm saying. If you're putting hard work into getting heard, that's real cool. And that's, that's, that's definitely necessary. But I, don't, I just think that the priority should be putting hard work into developing your sound. And then, you know, maybe teaming up with the right people to help you get out there. Because what I'm discovering is I can't put hard work into getting out there and into my music. One of them is going to have to suffer. It's a lot of work. Especially if you're not making a living off your music and you actually have to work a regular job. It's well, a lot. A lot of people always, they all, because I'm probably, I need to be about, 400 people, but a lot of them say, like, uh, oh, you got to get a team. So how important yeah. is the team? <laughs> like, all of them, yeah. oh, you got to get a team. So. Yeah, I need a team, man. I, <laughs> I totally need a team. But I think what, what I'm thankful for is because I didn't have a team for so long, it really humbled me to really treasure the people who do have my back and to realize that, like, you don't, I mean, they don't have to be there. You, you're not owed a team. You're not owed a label. You're not owed a producer. You're not owed... A recording studio you might have to just buy yourself a microphone and watch like hours of tutorials and record yourself you know like just just taking it serious and realizing like if you really believe that your talent should be heard then you will do whatever it takes to get it out there that's the hard work i think that goes into it what would you like to say to all your fans people that have been supporting you so far so long what has been like what 13 years yeah i think i would like to say thank you and there's been a there's been people who I didn't know like I they couldn't find me and in the last year randomly and this is perfect timing and this is what I mean by following God and like ma making it bigger than some law or like hard work because I've been working hard all this time but at the right moment when when my heart was ready and and when I was feeling confident and I was asking those questions of is it worthy I mean all of the right confirmation came through lately I mean everywhere whether it was church random people saying stuff like hey you've been waiting a long time and and you know hold on because god's about to do this or oh you must be a singer because i can just like see you. i mean like crazy i don't know if you believe in stuff like that but that's been happening a lot just random encouragement powerful encouragement and some of that has been fans randomly like being like oh i've been searching for you for 10 years hoping that you would do music again and i'm like really like i'm not like really like, there, you know, that would have been helpful, like, five, ten years ago. But I, I stuck on, and I, I got stuck in it for myself. And I found the right reason for why I need to make music, whether I have a single fan anymore. And now that I found that confidence, the fans started pouring back in, you know? And I only have a few that have actually found me, but I know that I have more out there. So I guess what I would say is um, thank you for looking for me. Thank you for waiting for me. And for those who haven't heard my music or um, don't know who I am yet, I would just say <laughs> I'm really excited. I'm excited to introduce myself again to you guys. Yeah, you know, I, said, I was actually really happy to, uh, to find you because I actually really like ch um, Chills. That's like my song. I, it's my, I, write, I really listen to that song a lot, so I like it. It's really, really cool. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right, we'll say thank you for coming through politicking with me. Anything you'd like to leave us with? Are you good? What's um, up? Yeah, I would just say um, check out my YouTube. It's Gab's Whole Story. Um, my Instagram is at Gab's Whole Story. Um, Spotify, I'm on there as Gabrielle Solange, and I'm also on all streaming services. Um, just subscribe, follow, and stay up to date. I will definitely be focusing a lot more on putting out more content. Um, and I'm really thankful. Thanks for having me on the show, man. You're welcome. Be good. The Poe Politicking Show is brought to you by Audible. 
With over 180,000 titles to choose from, Audible is great for any continuous learner wanting to grow and expand their knowledge and insight. Go to www.audibletrial.com slash PO audio and get an audio book of your choice free with a 30 day trial. After the trial, your paid membership will begin at $14.95 per month. With your membership, you will receive one credit every month. Good for an audiobook on Audible. Cancel before your trial ends and you will not be charged. So go to www.audibletrial.com slash PO audio and download a free book by Tony Robbins, Grant Cardone, Napoleon Hill, Les Brown, Damon John, and more. Always remember that knowledge is power.